Our topic this evening is France and the United States and the prospect for European unification. Our guest, as you know, is His Excellency Jacques Andreani, Ambassador of France to the United States. We're in the midst of the process of European unification with Maastricht not far behind us and Edinburgh just around the corner. The Danish vote, the recent Swiss referendum, even France's close vote indicate deep reservations about unification. Surely the evolution of Europe's political, economic, security, and diplomatic structures is not entirely clear. In trying to understand this process better, what perspective could be more interesting concerning long-term architecture and immediate problems of transition than that of France, long an intellectual force for European unification, generally a believer in European centrism, and certainly an assertive and key player. We are fortunate, then, to have Ambassador Andreani with us this evening. Born in 1929, he earned a degree from the Institut d'Etudes Politiques in Paris before being admitted to the École Nationale d'Administration in 1951. In 1953, he joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. His early overseas posts included Washington and Moscow. In 1964, he became Deputy Assistant Secretary for East European Affairs. In 1970, first counselor of the French delegation to NATO. And in 1972, he re returned to the Foreign Ministry where he was responsible for the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe. In 1973 and 74, he headed the French delegation to the CSCE in Geneva. In January 1975, he was named Director of European Affairs at the Foreign Ministry. Monsieur Andreani was ambassador to Egypt from 1979 to 1981 and Director of Political Affairs at the Foreign Affairs Ministry from 1981 to 1988. In 1988, he was appointed, he was appointed ambassador of France, the senior rank in the French diplomatic service. He became ambassador of France to the United States on November 9th, 1989. It is a very great pleasure and honor for us then to welcome him here to the council this evening, Ambassador Jacques Andreani. Thank you very much for your welcome. I speak to you uh, at the end of a, of a long day in Baltimore, which allowed me to, uh, to see that uh, not only was uh, Baltimore beautiful under the snow, but also that uh, it uh, had a lot of interesting realizations in the field of uh, social services. This is what I explored today. I discussed with your mayor this morning, and I explored during the day, and I was quite fascinated with what I saw. But I'm not going to talk to you about uh, that, but rather about uh, France's economy, uh, European integration, and world economic problems. First, a, word, a few words about France. In a world where recession is almost everywhere, the situation of my country is not too difficult. It is not, we have not a recession, but rather uh, we have not recession, we have not a negative growth, only the rate of growth is now low, uh, less than 2% a year, and forecasts for the coming years are not, for the coming year, uh, is not, are not very good. Uh, we have also, uh, with such a growth rate, uh, difficulty to create jobs and a high unemployment. This is the result of uh, years of uh, rapid growth, high consumption, easy credit. The, econo the economy must eliminate uh, excess indebtedness. Companies must diminish their costs. We are not the only country with these problems. Part of this job of uh, sanitation of the, world, uh, of, the, of the French economy has been accomplished already. The financial situation of our firms is much better. French products benefit from an enhanced competitiveness. Our economy is basically sound. 
Over the last 40 years, it has become very much part of the global economy. One of the signs of that uh, international, internationalization of uh, our economy uh, uh, has been the, the very strong trend uh, of our people to invest abroad, in particular to the United States in the last 10 years. I would say that 10 to 15 French uh, companies have spent uh, more than $1 billion each for uh, direct investment here uh, in this country. The policy, the economic policy of the French government is aimed primarily at fighting inflation and uh, in the present circumstances our authorities are resisting firmly any tendency to alter this basic orientation against inflation. The budget deficit of the state has been kept well under the ratio of 3% of the gross domestic product. Inflation is currently at 3% uh, with a tendency to go a little under, uh, one of the lowest among the European community countries. The high rate of the French franc is one of the factors which make this slow inflation possible. I insist on this anti-inflationary anti policy because uh, it has a political and historical relevance. In the past, inflation had been a temptation to which France had not always resisted and there were uh, cycles of wage and prices hikes and devaluations of the currency. In, uh, in the first two years of the socialist government, 81 to 83, the, uh, the, the, the government uh, uh, engaged in a, in, a, in a great number of very important social and economic reforms which had their costs in terms of budget deficit and inflation. The decision taken in, 90, in, 19, uh, in, in 1983 to revert to a policy of austerity, of rigor, of financial uh, uh, rigor, was made necessary, among other things, by the globalization of the world econ economy. In that environment, the only way uh, a particular nation could, uh, uh, could pursue a policy which would not take account of the laws of the markets would have been to isolate itself completely from the outside world, uh, running contrary to this overall tendency to globalization and to, open, uh, and to opening of, uh, of every border. The choice was made to accept the opening and to reject isolation. And in this way, France could continue to be a full partner in the EEC. After nine years of this policy of, uh, of, of, of rigor, of, uh, of financial austerity, what is the result? The judgment passed on the economic performance of France is positive. It is in the, still in the midst of a slowdown, but it can pick up very quickly. One of the ways of measuring the degree of confidence which is given to France is the development of foreign investment in our country, which went up, for example, last year from, uh, 90 to, uh, 90, from 91 to 92, went up by 30 percent, including a, a great leap forward in uh, American investments in France. A more uh, resounding proof of the, of, uh, is, is given by the currency crisis of last September, after mass massive speculation had forced the British and the Italians to devalue their currency and to leave the European monetary system, the same speculators failed in their attacks against the franc. Uh, it means, uh, I, I guess, that objectively it was recognized by the markets that the fundamental elements of the economic situation in my country are sound and did not warrant a change in the rate of the franc. We are, of course, uh, uh, haunted by occasion, the question, the, the same question which arises everywhere, are, are, we, are, we, are we going to get out of the slowdown of the economy? Obviously, the question is a global one. Everyone is looking over the shoulder. The uh, Americans are impatiently asking the Germans to re lower their interest rates, and the Europeans are hoping that the U.S. economy will finally pick up and pull the others 
towards more growth. How soon will the recession end? Well, I think uh, the answer it will not fail to end, but now, when? Uh, there are cyclical elements which will not fail to work. Once the people who were too much in debt here or, uh, or in Europe have gone out of debt, uh, they will again engage in more spending. Once companies have restored their financial situation, they will begin again to invest. And both in the United States and in Europe, we begin, we begin to see maybe some signs of the light at the end of the tunnel. Then I have a particularly great confidence in the capacity of the US economy to rebound because this country is rich in one of the most uh, essential commodities, which is the spirit of enterprise, the ability to launch and exploit new ideas, new products, new formulas. And politically, I think the conditions are obviously present here for a new start. A German, a German contribution to world growth through a lowering in the interest rates will take more time to come. Uh, but in the years to come, I'm convinced that the Germans will succeed, that they will be able to achieve the integration of, their, of the devastated economy of the uh, Eastern lender. And finally, we in France are ready. We, uh, as I said, uh, we have a basically sound situation with a good currency and uh, without any major unbalance, I think we suffer more from political tensions and psychological blocks than from any serious objective difficulty of the economy. We are, of course, strongly dependent on the process of European unification. It is vital. It is vital for us and also for our neighbors and partners in Europe. If this process fails, we are doomed. If it succeeds, we may have hope. It was in 1950 that we started this process. The ideas at the time were coming from two good French men, Jean Monnet and Robert Schumann. In 40 years, we achieved a lot. We got reconciliation between France and Germany, economic convergence between the six original members of the common market, enlargement to six more countries. In 1985, and then in 1990, following initiatives from two other Frenchmen, Jacques Delors and François Mitterrand, and also from Chancellor Kohl of Germany, we set ourselves ambitious goals. First, the completion of a unified market. Then, the convergence of the economies pushed to the point where monetary union could be possible, which could mean, in the last stage, doing away with our national currency and replacing them with a single monetary unit. Then, political union, that is improving the institutions of the community to make the decision-making process more easy and laying the basis for common action of the 12 of the community in the field of foreign policy and defense. Uh, these ambitious goals, going beyond the, the simple fact of the unified market, going beyond that to monetary union, to political union, were uh, set out in the Treaty of Maastricht. As you know, the process of ratification of the Treaty of Maastricht has run into difficulties with the negative vote of the Danes, the very narrow majority in France, and the rather strong opposition in the United Kingdom. More generally, one senses in several countries misgivings about the integration process. Maastricht is a great leap forward, and it generates fear of the unknown. People are concerned about the future because of the economic situation, because of the changes of society. They want to find comfort in their national identities and they believe that these national identities could be lost 
in the process of building a united Europe. There is a natural tendency in times of difficulties to blame the problems on the neighbor. To say, for example, that unemployment is due to the fact that your borders are wide open to the other community countries. In some, it is more difficult to cooperate in hard times than it is when the going is smooth. What are, realistically, the prospects for the European community now? There are two things. First, the single space without internal borders, which has nothing to do with the Treaty of Maastricht, which is interior, which is before, prior to the Treaty of Maastricht. This should go on as expected on the 1st of January, that is, within a few days. There will be some delay on one point, which is a complete free movement of persons uh, through the borders, because uh, we have not yet agreed on all the points of our common policy in the field of immigration and on our action against crime, terrorism, narcotics. Such entente is necessary because, since, uh, because once the controls will be suppressed at the borders, at the borders between two countries or uh, between the countries of the community, once somebody will enter one of the 12 countries, he will be able to move freely without any controls in the 11 others. But hopefully this will be put into place in due time, and for the rest, the single market is already operating or will be fully operating uh, from, as from the beginning of next year. Then there is Maastricht. Denmark is contemplating a second referendum by which it would uh, hopefully approve ratification with a few assurances on, the, on some points. In the United Kingdom, Mr. Major is facing strong opposition. We uh, is facing it and it's fighting it as he can. We very much hope in France that the difficulties will be overcome and that the treaty will be put into force. If, for some reason, it were not possible it would be a very serious setback for Europe, with, I think, adverse consequences for everybody, including here. But I still believe that even in such a case, we would find ways to, we would find our way somehow to resume our journey towards integration. It would take more time. It would uh, possibly not involve all the present members of the community, but somehow we would be again on our way. Then we are dependent, of course, on the, for our growth, as you are, on the development of, tr of international trade. And uh, the question is, will we be able to establish better rules which would enhance the prospect for our growth? Uh, this is, in particular, the big question in the current negotiation of the Uruguay Round. Every day, our position is grossly, uh, I'm talking about the French position, is grossly misrepresented in the media of this country. So allow me to try to set things straight. The matter is presented in an oversimplified way. It is said that uh, an agreement is almost ready, which will give a fantastic boost to world trade, but the only obstacle, it is said, uh, is the selfish obstinacy of a small number of French farmers who refuse to cut back farm subsidies. Is it not what you hear and what you read every day in your newspaper? To this caricature of the situation, I shall oppose the following points. First, we do not think as that as it is emerging, the overall result of the GATT talks will be that fantastic. On many items, such as intellectual property, we are on the same side as the United States, but we do not think that progress will be as great as we would have hoped. Uh, on f the financial services, the action of the banks over overseas, uh, abroad, we are asking for more liberalization. We have a position which is more liberal than the American position, but we are not satisfied with what is shaping up. The most essential chapter of the GATT, which concerns access to market, which includes tariff, tariff concessions, 
is not at all settled. It's not at all ready. And on some products, uh, there are, uh, and there are, and there are in this chapter, very strong protectionist positions, including on some chapters from the United States. Finally, uh, we see that the United States is not prepared to, uh, to accept a really multilateral system of, uh, for the enhancement of free trade since, since, since it is not prepared to do away with the bad habit of imposing unilateral sanctions on its trade partners. In sum, we are a little bit afraid that the day this agreement, which has been presented as uh, promising the world a heap of bounties, once the agreement is completed and when the gift wrap is open, everybody will be a bit disappointed. One of the reasons progress has been so uh, scarce in most of the important chapters of the GATT talks is that too much emphasis has been put on agriculture and not enough efforts have been made on the other subjects. Now, second point. It is just not true to state that France is opposed to cutting down farm subsidies. In fact, the European farm subsidies have already been cut down last May when the European community decided to overhaul its agricultural policy. And France was not at all the country which resisted the slashing of the farm subsidies. Quite the contrary. The issue in the present phase is not the, the amount of subsidies. The point now is that on top of the reduction of subsidies, the U.S. demands that the European community should agree to diminish by 21% the volume of its agricultural exports. Strange demand in the name of free trade to ask us to abstain voluntarily from exporting products for which we can find outlets. Why? Why this extraordinary demand? Because although we have cut down on our export subsidies, they still exist on a smaller scale. So we are being told, okay, your food exports are, your food exports are less subsidized, but they are still directly subsidized, so you should limit and reduce them. If every party on the agreement was called upon to do the same, we would say fair enough, but not at all. In the draft agreement, as it was, uh, as it was uh, uh, concluded uh, by the negotiators of the European Commission and the uh, negotiator of the US government, the cut on exports, the cut on the volume of exports, again, it's not a question of subsidies, it's a question of reducing the volume of exports, putting a cap on exports and diminishing them. The, volume, the, the cuts on exports would be far heavier for the EC than it would be for the United States. For the EC, the reduction of exports, the reduction would apply to exports of almost all food products. Food products. But for, for the United States, for many products, not only the United States would not have to diminish their exports, but would be free to increase them without any limit. Why? Because in the American system of farm support, there are few specific export subsidies. So you are supposed to be clean, and you will be free to export as much as you, you want. But of course it is not true. In the US, in most cases, food exports are subsidized not directly, but indirectly. Your farmers get huge deficiency payments, which are not related to exports, and are not counted as export subsidies. But when a farmer from the Midwest, as it happens, sells its grain on the world market at a loss that is below the cost, below its cost, it does, he can do that. He can do that because at the end of the month, he gets a fat check from the US Department of Agriculture. So your deficiency payment, partially, and, uh, but really, but effectively, plays, operates as an export subsidy. Yet it is not counted as such 
and you are clean, and for many products you will be export, you will be able to export as much as you want to new markets that used to be our markets and to which we will be prohibited from selling. No wonder that we find this draft quite unfair. Why then will you ask, is France the only member of the European community uh, which opposes the proposed deal? First, this remains to be seen. There are oppositions to the projects in all agricultural circles in the community, and several governments are unhappy about the results. It is normal that the outcry against such an unfair settlement should be stronger in France, which in the EC is the greatest exporter of food products. The whole matter will have to be discussed thoroughly between the EC partners. Uh, it is premature to take a definitive stand before this debate has taken place, but pending that debate, pending the conclusion of that debate, the French government objects to this draft agreement and uh, considers it should not be accepted as it stands. Compared to this very important subject, the Euro-American dispute on oil seeds is a side issue. We recognize that there is a basis for the U.S. complaints about our oil seed subsidies, uh, and the only dispute has been over the amount of compensation. A deal was made at the same time of the deal on agriculture in the GATT, and uh, uh, it still has to be approved by the member states of the community. More important than the substance of the dispute is the method that has been used. The method of sanctions. As you know, the United States has imposed sanctions on the import of a number of products, including French white wine. Uh, but this, this, is, this has been lifted. They have, they have been lifted. But this was the method used to uh, strong arm uh, in the negotiation. Well, we have something against this method, and we think that one of the benefits we expect from a GATT agreement would be more use of multilateral procedures for settling disagreements and less recourse to unilateral steps. Another example of this method has just been given by the U.S. authorities, which have imposed countervailing duties on the importation of steel from the EC and many other countries. And it looks to us a little bit as if the U.S. administration was making use of an anti-subsidy regulation in order, in fact, to close the U.S. market and to raise domestic prices at the expense of the U.S. consumers. It is quite unjustified to describe the European community as a fortress. In trade wars, the European community is basically non-armed because it is still divided. And can, agree, and can agree only with great difficulty on the steps which a trade war would imply. I do not pretend that the European countries are devoid of protectionist spirit. It is present here and there. But as a group, we fear restrictive or punitive measures. And we observe the presence of protectionist temptations everywhere, including in some cases in the United States. Nobody calls himself protectionist, but protectionism can flourish under the name of fair trade. And I see in some discussions in this country that for some people, uh, the, the name of free trader is on the point of becoming an insult. And I think it is regrettable. We wish the European community to be open and we wish our American friends to be truly fair, to protect a multilateral trade system, to be cautious in the use of the dangerous retaliatory weapons that the U.S. Congress has given to the President and the administration. We wish them also to be just in their treatment of the foreign companies established in the U.S. as we are to theirs in Europe. Crossed international investment is a plus for international trade and for economic growth and should not be discouraged by excessive taxation. Now, 
Another point. Even if rules are established which suppress obstacles to free trade, commercial currents can still be disrupted by the changes in the currency rates. And I would say sometimes by the erratic changes in the currency rates. It is a problem that the Americans are less accustomed to consider uh, than we are. Uh, because the dollar is so universally present that uh, you have sometimes a tendency to forget about the existence of the other currencies. But uh, if, you, if I can take an example, the anger of the French farmers in the presence of the proposed GATS deal on agriculture is compounded by the perception that the low rate of the dollar makes it already quite easy for U.S. farm products to invade outside markets in which we were accustomed to sell. It is just an example, but you should think about that. When we say that more stability is desirable about the currencies, in the currencies, our idea is not to suppress the fluctuations between currencies. This is impossible, and it is not the aim. But maybe it would be possible to increase monetary cooperation on a worldwide basis so as to to avoid excessive fluctuations. This is what we did in the community when we created, between us, when we created the European monetary system, which exists today. There is no way to adapt a system such as the Euro European monetary system to the relationship between the dollar, the yen, and the European currencies, but there might be ways for the industrialized countries to act in a more united fashion in this field. Something should be tried to regulate a little more the currency market. It is the only market which there are, in which there are no rules at all. Uh, no need to prohibit anything, of course, but after all, the, the stock market or the commodities markets are submitted to some kinds of regulation. I mean, people have you, to, you, you've got to tell people who you are, what is your capital, uh, what, what is your ratio uh, from certain operations to your, uh, to your equity and so on. Uh, nothing of the kind exists on the currency markets, and I think we should think about it. Two other questions which I have no time to discuss, but mentioning them in passing because they are important. First, I think a possible source of growth in the world can be found in the development of the former USSR and of the ex-communist countries. The current chaos in Russia and the other republics of the CIS will certainly last some time. But we can hope that little by little, a new economy, a free one, will emerge. On that day, an additional chance will be present for the US and still more for Europe, which is nearer and more prepared to deal with these countries. And we believe that these countries have, in the long run, a very rich potential. Then, Something more should be done for the developing countries to reduce their indebtedness and to help them to get out of poverty. On these two points, former communist countries, especially USSR, former USSR, and the developing countries, the amount of foreign assistance which is given by the industrialized countries is obviously not sufficient and, in our views, should be increased. These two problems should be, along with the other questions that I've been discussing, the object of more intense cooperation between the industrialized countries. As rich countries, we all have particular responsibilities. And if you list the problems, it is clear that there are a great number of these problems on which we basically pursue the same aim. And there are many world problems on which we work in a, very, in a climate of very efficient cooperation. We were side by side, the French and the Americans, in the war against Iraq. We are the, the two countries, the American is leading the operation in Somalia. France was the, the, the other country which was present immediately from the first day. We see eye to eye, we think, on the way to approach the problems of the, USS, the former USSR and uh, 
We also cooperate in Yugoslavia, where we have uh, 5,000 uh, of our soldiers present in very dangerous conditions. Uh, we are united in our desire to uh, fight the danger of nuclear and other form of proliferation. Uh, we want to develop politically the European community to go beyond a simple common market to uh, making the community of the 12 countries uh, an integrated uh, unit and also to gradually transform it into a new partner on the international scene which includes taking responsibilities, common responsibilities in the field of foreign policy and defense but we want to do that without diminishing in any way the role and the importance of NATO to which we are attached. And uh, when you see uh, all these uh, questions on which we are uh, seeing uh, very much eye to eye or on which we develop a very uh, dialogue in a, in a spirit of great understanding, uh, one thinks sometimes that it is a pity that attention seems to concentrate on some of these problems on which we happen to disagree and sometimes to quarrel. But uh, I hope uh, at least that this uh, little talk of today will help to dissipate uh, some of the misunderstanding. Thank you very much. Mr. Ambassador, we thank you very much for your overview and uh, for your kind words about uh, when we do agree and for your directness uh, on those areas where we don't. The Ambassador has agreed to answer questions until 10 minutes after 7. The floor is now open. Yes, sir. The, um, the assertion is that your approach to agriculture is absurd, <laughs> and, and, and the question is, what do you plan to do about it? Fair as you may. Yes. Well, I'm not sure what is a, what is a free market. In a, a, the, the laws of the market are not uh, quite the same in the field of... Uh, I mean, they, they, they cannot apply exactly in the same way in the field of agriculture. I mean, when you have... Uh, for, for several reasons. Uh, when you have uh, uh, a very great excess of products uh, in, relation to the, in relation to the demand, uh, you, finally you have, no, you have no world price. I mean, it's an illusion. You have no, you have no world price of, uh, of, uh, of cereals today. This is not true. You have, a, you have a number of operations which are being conducted at certain prices, but there is, no, there is not a price at the market. This is not true. Uh, the, the, the main... The main uh, the main problem we see with the agricultural policy, we see as the we have seen as the agricultural policy as it was as it was conducted up to la la this year, was that it was extremely costly. It was costly both to the consumers and to uh, the budget of the community and then of, the, of the member states of the community. That is why we decided to reform the agricultural policy. And I can assure you that in the discussions. France was the country who was pushing the prices down. We do not want, we have, a, we have a very efficient agriculture and we have no interest in having support prices so high as they were. And it is our good uh, German colleagues who have a less productive agriculture 
who wanted to keep support prices very high. So there was a compromise, and we had this reform of last May. Uh, it was a compromise, but uh, we agree that the level of, of support was excessive, and we pushed to diminish the price support and to compensate it by another type of support, just as the U.S. government is doing. The U.S. government is subsidizing not the production or the exportations, but the farmer itself himself, and we are trying to go over to this, um, to this system, to such a system. But we cannot do that brutally, 100% uh, uh, overnight. It is impossible, because uh, it, would, it would lead to, uh, to, uh, to uh, humanly, it would have terrible consequences. We, we have to do it gradually. That is one of the reasons why we didn't push down the prices as much as we hoped to do it. We reduced the subsidies, the support, the internal support, the su price supports by about 30 percent, which is a lot. And uh, maybe uh, in the years to come, we'll do it, uh, uh, we, we do it more. The other reason why it was not more, why the price supports were not more, were not reduced more, is precisely that some other countries, including Germany in particular, did not want to, to raise, to, to lower to lower the support prices, to lower the support prices. Now, we have reformed our agriculture, uh, our agricultural policy already. It has led to a lot of trouble with the farmers, to a lot of discontent. We are able to absorb it politically. Maybe in further stages we will do more to reduce our farm expenses and to, and to cut down our price supports, but not not, but on our own, on our own, according to modalities which we will decide ourselves, and not under the, the pressure of an international negotiation. And it is not true to say that only the pressure of international, international pressure will, uh, will bring us to do that. The example is that last May we did it separately from the, from the GATT negotiation. So there will be certainly other uh, evolutions of our agricultural policy in, in the direction that you wish. But it will take time, and politically it cannot succeed if it is imposed from abroad by pressure of other powers. Recent um, increase in nationalism in Germany could you comment on France's position? Do you see any potential problems, any special concerns, and what, if anything, is France doing about it? Well, in view of, uh, of past history, we have all reasons to, 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 to not to consider these things with a, with a light heart and to, to, be very, uh, to be very attentive and very vigilant. On the other hand, uh, uh, basically our policy since the war has been, uh, has been based on a, on, a, on a postulate of confidence vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis the new Germany, uh, because we feel that uh, Nazism is uh, one thing and democracy is another thing. And we saw the Germans take the way of democracy. Uh, they did it well, they did it fully. And uh, so we, our basic attitude is an attitude of trust towards the Germans. But of course, the Germans, uh, they are, uh, they are uh, 60 uh, and some million, and, uh, and among them uh, there are uh, a number of uh, people who, have, uh, uh, who are still uh, thinking uh, on, uh, about uh, on, on lines which uh, are, are, are very bad. And it is a fact that there is, there is, a, there is a, an upsurge of that uh, um, currently. Um, and I think it's, a, it's in great uh, part a result of the absorption of the eastern provinces and uh, of the of whole the, the, the social and cultural uh, upheaval that it, this has created. Um, uh, there is a lot of frustration in, uh, among the youth in the eastern part of Germany. Uh, in particular, it spreads to other parts. and. Uh, uh, so uh, we, we, we look at all these phenomena, but uh, we, 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 we do not think they have, they have reached uh, 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 an extent which will be really 
very a very great preoccupation. But we are we are we are looking at that with uh, with uh, with certainly some some uh, uh, some attention uh, some attention while uh, maintaining our uh, our faith our trust in uh, the uh, the commitment of uh, people like uh, Cole and indeed the. the uh, almost all the, the, the known leaders of the major uh, political parties in Germany. Yeah. Yes, sir, on the aisle. What do you see of the British and the English? Are they going to go along with this, or are they going to be the Thatcher pushing south and the Rangers have this problems over there? Are they going to join in or not? Would, would you be willing to speculate yeah. on... Uh, uh, how the British are going to approach the uh, questions of unification? Hmm. Well, I, I think if you look at uh, if you look at things from a short-term perspective, you have a situation which is uh, rather uh, uh, difficult because uh, obviously uh, the, the the British, for some reasons, uh, uh, have not included in their uh, in their constitutional uh, arsenal the use of the referendum. But if they had. Uh, and if they had put the Maastricht Treaty to a referendum, it's practically sure that there they, they, they would have been a negative answer. Uh, so, the, and, and there is a position among the, the Conservative Party, and of course there is obviously a majority which can uh, ratify the Maastricht Treaty, but uh, it's always difficult, you know, to rely on your opposition, and uh, you have people from your own party who vote against, that's not very sound. Uh, Etc. So they have a, they have a political problem which is serious, and uh, and uh, and there are points uh, on which uh, obviously the, the 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 British are very reluctant. They don't like some aspects of the Maastricht Treaty. Their government accepted uh, because they, they wanted a compromise, but uh, but it was difficult for them. And they didn't accept it wholeheartedly. I mean, I, when I speak, uh, when I, I'm thinking of the of the monetary system, for example, or the free uh, the free movement of, uh, of 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 people, even in the, even in uh, in a single act before the the, the Maastricht Treaty, they they have uh, they have uh, problems with all that. So the situation is not too good. Now, if you look if you look at the problem from a long term trend for, on a long term curb, uh, trend, you'll see that, uh, that uh, there is uh, uh, almost constant progress in the identification of the United Kingdom with Europe. Uh, the, the, the business circles are for it. They, they, they understand that it is the only way for Great Britain. There was, uh, if, the, if, uh, if uh, the United Kingdom uh, went into uh, the European monetary system, it is because of the pressure of the business circles. It's true that now they are out, but they are out because uh, there was this crisis last September, and let's hope that they will come in again, go in again. So uh, I think there are some reasons on, on, a, on, a, very, on a very long trend to, 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 to think that somehow they will, they will, they will get, they will, they, they, they will, uh, they will join the, 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 the general trend. Considering, Mr. Ambassador, the historic friendship between the French people and the Serbian people, has the French government a position on what is happening in Yugoslavia right now? Well, the French, uh, the French government, uh, uh, whatever, uh, first of all, whatever the, 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 the friendship between the Serbian people and the, and the French people, which I don't deny, uh, you must realize that in France, the pressure of the public of public opinion is not at all in favor of the Serbs. Not at all. It is uh, it is completely on the other side. I mean, the the, the, the public uh, is uh, is uh, stricken, uh, is struck as uh, as as uh, everywhere in France by the uh, the, the, the what happens uh, in uh, uh, what happened first in Croatia and then in Bosnia and uh, and there is no. Uh, there is no uh, there is no pressure of the of the public to uh, support in any way uh, uh, Serbia. Uh, that's the first point. Now the second point is that uh, obviously uh, the, the 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 responsibilities in this horrible situation are not all on one side. They are certainly 
verrait unevenly, unevenly distributed. This is quite, uh, I, can, uh, uh, I can see that the Serbs are responsible for uh, a great part of the atrocities and the, the horrible things that have been happening, the camps and uh, the ethnic cleansing and so on. But I wouldn't say that the, 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 the other uh, parties in, the, in, the, in, the, in this situation are entirely, are entirely, uh, entirely clean. And so it's a, it's a very sad situation, and we do not think, we do not think that we, we think that we must do something about it. God, God knows that we, we have tried to do a lot of things about it. Our, our president went to Sarajevo. We have 5,000 soldiers um, there, including, uh, including 3,000 in Bosnia, in very difficult situation, in very difficult conditions. We have uh, our uh, NGO, a lot of people who are trying to help these uh, people uh, medically uh, and uh, with humanitarian assistance and so on. And, and we must, we, 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 we want to continue uh, uh, to do something, including, uh, including something maybe a bit, uh, a bit stronger. But it is, a, it, is a, it is a situation which is extremely complex. I mean, you, you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, just uh, decide that uh, uh, the UN or uh, such and such countries are going to mount an expedition and to, and to wage war against the Serbians. That's not possible because it's too, the situation is too intricate. I mean, you have, uh, you have problems everywhere of, of various nature, and it's a, it's, a, it's a total confusion. So you cannot, it's not a clear cut situation as Iraq uh, was. So we are, we are very upset, very, very, uh, very uh, revulsed by, 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 revolted by, by the, 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 the situation. We, we try to do what we can. Uh, in some, our position is not very different from the American position. Yes, sir, at the microphone. Uh, one of the great mysteries to me is the differential between costs in Europe for an American and an American at home. For instance, a cup of coffee in America to an American would require roughly five to ten minutes of his productive or his income. And when we go to Europe, it would take a, a half an hour of our income to buy a cup of coffee. Now, I don't understand whether the Europeans are making four times as much as an American in their own currency so that they can afford to buy a cup of coffee. Uh, it, it's a dichotomy that's beyond my imagination. Well, I give you a few, uh, a few, a few answers. Do you want to repeat? I think everybody heard the yeah. question, yeah. but it's, <laughs> it, it's basically, okay. uh, why doesn't a dollar go farther in Europe yeah, exactly. and, 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 and can Frenchmen uh, afford a cup of coffee? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, well, there are a few reasons. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, that uh, maybe the... Uh, the uh, the man who sells you a cup of coffee is, uh, or the man who sells coffee to the man who sells you a cup of coffee, having a more narrow market uh, makes a wider margin in percentage, and so that the, the over cost, the uh, what do you call that, the the, the 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 profit or something is is uh, or the what is taken by by the the, the various in the various stages is is higher in uh, in Europe. Uh, that's one reason, I think, and uh, and another reason is that uh, is that your um, uh, another reason is that the, uh, the 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 French and the other Europeans pay much more taxes than the Americans, and uh, in, including indirect taxes which are which are which are incorporated in the pri in prices, and it is a lot. And the third reason, uh, maybe the, the most important, is that the, the dollar is, uh, is undervalued and that you, you get not enough, uh, you don't get enough uh, francs or liras or pesetas for your dollar. As you should, if you consider just, the, uh, in other words, that the, 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 the proportions in the currency or rates is not the just proportion in terms of comparison of the prices. And you know that all the economists since uh, uh, 
Adam Smith say that, uh, say that the, the, free, uh, the free play of the forces of the market will necessarily bring the rates of currency at a point where the, uh, the prices, uh, in, uh, in, uh, the real prices in, uh, expressed in, uh, in the various currencies will be equalized. But it's um, somehow it doesn't work that way. That's right. uh, the, 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 the laws of free uh, economy do, do not always work. Uh. <laughs> yeah. If you give me your address, I, I'll give you the, 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 the answer in a figure. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Well, my question is a little different. I'm talking about the cost of food compared to the French income. Forget currencies. Yeah. The cost of food to, for French income or German income or, or Italian income compared to the cost of food to the American income mm. is so much greater. Why is that? It is, it is greater, I wouldn't say it's so much greater. It used to be much greater. Uh, 50 years ago, it was uh, the, the average Frenchman would, uh, would probably spend half of his income on, on food. And now it's probably 15% uh, or 18%, something like that. Probably more than here, but uh, not so much more. The, the, the tendency is to uh, uh, equalization, uh, towards equalization, I think. Yes, sir. The, the question is, uh, what is your government doing about the French right? Yeah. Well, uh, the, by, by definition, in a, in, a, in a free political system, there is not much that the government can do directly against the political, political tendency, however uh, evil it is, uh, because, uh, I mean, uh, there's uh, the First Amendment here, and there is uh, the equivalent of the First Amendment in France. I mean, uh, you, are, uh, you are free to, to express uh, uh, ideas, uh, however uh, uh, unpleasant uh, to the majority of the people they can be. Uh, we have laws. We have laws against uh, racism and uh, anti-Semitism, and, uh, and they are applied. The, 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 Monsieur Le Pen has been condemned many times, and his, uh, his, um, his uh, uh, I mean, press organs and uh, various uh, magazines of the extreme right have been condemned, were condemned many times uh, on, on these counts. But uh, they are condemned to a, to a, to a fine or to a, something like that, and uh, uh, that's all we can do. And uh, I don't think uh, nobody could uh, imagine that we will uh, jail uh, people just because they have, uh, they have extreme right tendencies. This wouldn't be quite fair. Now, another point is education, and we, we, we try to do that uh, as much as we can. Uh, in the schools, uh, civic education, education in, uh, in the respect of the other nations, of the other races, and uh, there, there is a lot of preoccupation about, about developing that and about, uh, about, uh, about fortifying this uh, uh, respect of the others. And, uh, and we try also, of course, to, to solve the problems uh, which, uh, which can uh, uh, which, which can, um, which can uh, lead to tensions which in turn nourish the, the, the extreme right tendencies. What I mean is the, the, the situation in, the, in, the, in, the, in some of the cities, some of the suburbs in particular, where, in particular where there are a lot of, uh, of uh, both of unemployment and also of uh, unemployed, French unemployed, and also of immigrants, employed or unemployed, there are tensions. At certain, it gives rise, to, as in Germany, as in other countries in Europe, to uh, xenophobic uh, feelings. So, uh, part of the answer is in trying to cure these uh, these problems. Uh, and it's, uh, of course, it's not easy. It's not done over there. It's not done overnight. But that's what we're trying to do. I have to apologize to all of you. The evening has gone far too quickly. Uh, we try to end our sessions at uh, 10 minutes after. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, you've provided us with a, a, a very helpful evening. 
very thorough presentation, one we've enjoyed, and uh, we're just terribly sorry that uh, our time is up. We thank you very much. Thank you.